Hello and welcome to this week's episode of Mastering Dungeons. I'm Sean Merwin here with a very special guest on a very special episode. I have with me this week Mike Sly Flourish Shea. Hey Mike, thanks for joining me this week. Hey Sean, it's great to be here. This is awesome. Thank you for inviting me. My pleasure. Teos is swimming in the Mediterranean or some such thing. So we, we're going his loss. to. His, exactly. Who wouldn't right. want to be here right as the great Marv Levy of this the Buffalo Bills? I'm having said. fun. Are you having fun? Because I'm, I'm having, having fun. fun. I am having right. fun. And let's, let's just jump right into more fun by going to our listener corner. Uh, our first question comes from Falcon. Toot bag. Yes, toot bag, tweet bag. Toot bag. I just, I just, I really came on the show just so I could say the word toot bag. Toot bag. Well, you could say it several times. Just shout out toot bag at random in the middle of the show. <laughs> like, like I just did. <laughs> like you just did. <laughs> but uh, before we, we, we toot, let's go to uh, Patreon <laughs> and, and to Falcon Neal, who says 4E split the D&D player base with Pathfinder garnering a community who preferred 3.5's style and complexity. This year, a subset of angry online players has expressed a desire to leave the WotC ecosystem. Is that splinter viable if they don't coalesce around a particular competitor? Is there a minimum audience size needed for an alternative system to be long-term successful? How much of a system's success is owed to the ease of being able to find others playing the same game system you already know? Mike, I think you liked this question, so I'm going to let I do. you start. Yeah, talk to me. Sure. Uh, oh, there's so many. There's so many facets. It's 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 like a twenty sided die of a mm -hmm. question. It's got a right. lot of different sides to consider. Vi viability being kind of a, a I think a key a key focal point of of this whole thing, and the viability of other systems. So kind of getting past the idea of like people being angry at wi wizards and moving to other systems and stuff like that. There's also this like how for for a completely different system, how what what does viability mean? And I bring up the idea that, like, if there's one human being left on the planet with a copy of Iron Sworn, it's viable, right? Because mm -hmm. Iron Sworn is a solo playable game. You only need one human being who's interested in playing in a copy of the book, and it's, you know, kind of viable. I don't know that somebody would refer to that as as viability, right? That any right. any RPG where you can find, you know, whatever number of players plus one GM willing to run it is is viable. Mm -hmm. And I I, I I I talked about this in in, in on other platforms as well that like i think viability means a lot less than we think it's not like world of warcraft or you know any kind of online game where like if the company decides they're not going to maintain the servers anymore that 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 game is dead which can definitely happen we don't really have to worry about that as much as long as we have a book and we're willing to play and we're willing to find players but it can be tricky to find players when i when i have brought this idea up that i, I didn't think popularity really mattered that much i got a lot of people say yeah it absolutely does because like if i want to play blades in the dark it's way harder for me to find players to play Blades in the Dark than it is to play find players to play 5e D&D. &D. And that can be true. But then, so I, I asked, I actually put up a poll on, on a, my YouTube channel and said, hey, how do you get you know people to play other games? And they're all like, you ask, right? Like, ask your friends to play another game. And like 90 some people said like that the way to play that is, is to just ask ask people to, uh, to, to play a different game. Mm -hmm. And they will. So I think a lot of it is like, do you have a group who is willing to try other games is probably the thing to aim for. That if you can if you can put together a group and get people that are happy to be together, enjoying these stories that we tell and sharing in these in this fun, you could probably say like, hey guys, how would you want to try Shadow Dark for a session? You know, what if we wanted to try Shadow Dark just for a couple of sessions? I know we love our 5e game, I love 5e, but I'd like to try a couple of sessions of Shadow Dark. If, they're, if they've been with you a while, they'll probably be willing to, to, to go. And that doesn't mean you have to do like this full scale switch over to another system. Like I'm, you know, leaving one completely and going to another one. You can just try some things out. And I've done this. I've done this with my groups. I've done. I have multiple groups, and all of them have been willing for to try to try other systems. So I think getting that initial group together, maybe you got to go aim for a more popular platform, mm -hmm. you know, a more popular system. But once you have a group that's been together and playing for a while, they're there for you more than they're there for the game. And I think that that's yeah. the that's where the switch happens, right? If, mm -hmm. if people are just looking for a game to play and you're like, I want to run Honey Heist and no one wants to play Honey Heist, right? Except they all want to play 5e D&D. &D. Well, that's because they're not looking for Honey Heist. They're looking for, uh, you know, the system. But once they're like, oh, I like Sean. I want to play with Sean. And Sean's like, hey, yeah, how would you, you know, I'm, I'm a little tired. And I didn't have time to prep. Can I, how about a game of Honey Heist instead? They're like, sure, Sean, give it a go. I want to be a bear that goes on a heist. Exactly. So, yeah. Yeah. So I think I think that real question of like, what does viability mean to you? And I think we each get to kind of determine that. Like nobody gets to 
there's no ISO standard for viability for RPGs. Like we get to we get to kind of decide whether one is popular or not. One one tiny little agenda I want to throw in here yeah. is you can be fully supportive of 5e and not support Wizards of the Coast. And I'm I'm still support Wizards of the Coast. I like Wizards of the Coast. I'm still going to buy their products. I'm not I'm you know for those who love them, I'm not knocking them. But I know that there are people out there who that enough has gone on with Wizards of the Coast over the last six months that they really don't want to associate with D and D and Wizards of the Coast specifically. And 5e is like Linux now, right? There's lots of different ways to engage in 5e. There's, you know, three versions of 5e that are going to be out there for you to try more, and more. Mm -hmm. And there's so there's th you know thousands of supplements that you can use for 5e, and never and never really have to pick any one company, even if you don't like. It could be anybody else too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, I, 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 he is still I, viable. Yeah, I, I think that that's a good point, and that Pathfinder was viable, specifically in a perfect storm sort of way, because. It wasn't, we need you to change to this new game we're making. It was, you can stay and keep playing the game you've been playing without doing anything. Yeah, it's a new book. Yeah, tweaks here and there. But it's basically, here's here's third edition. You keep playing it. That made Pathfinder super viable. It also was a perfect storm because Paizo had experience making things. They had experience making good adventures. They had experience creating magazines. So they were a good group to be carrying on this third edition game. They also had funding from Wizards of the Coast. Uh, people <laughs> forget that. People forget that Paizo uh, was basically a, a farm team. And I'm going to give a sports reference, right? They, they were a, the baseball farm team. Yeah, I don't know what you're. Uh, I don't know what you're talking yeah, about. Of course, of course, you know. Uh, yeah. But you know, they had a license for to do Dungeon and Dragon magazine that they were supposed to pay a licensing fee, and from what I've heard, they rarely did, or they didn't. <laughs> they didn't. The Wizards was like, oh, don't worry about it. Don't yeah. So like, Wizards was funding this company that ended up. So it was it was perfect. Now. Get, now you're going to be competing if you make a 5th edition clone, if you make a Tales from the Valiant, if you make one of those things, you will likely be competing against Wizards of the Coast in the same arena, mm -hmm. which is both good and bad. It's good because there may not be enough of a difference between all of these different clones that a reasonably adept player DM can't just say, well, I'm going to buy this supplement. Yes, it's for this other 5e system, but I can tweak it. I know what I'm doing. And so it's not really competing. It could be all the same. You're still swimming in the same pool. It's not any different than uh, right. what's happening now. If you buy a Cobalt Press supplement, uh, you, know, you buy some of their Midgard stuff, you can take it and you can do whatever you want with it in your regular 5e campaign. And it could be close enough that you could do that anyway. So there's no real competition, which makes it viable. What wouldn't be viable is if you make a completely different game and you don't have all of those things as a business, not not as a consumer. But I as think a Kelsey from Kelsey from Shadow Dark RPG with her one point three million dollars might disagree with you. Right. <laughs> like, For sure. <laughs> I, 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 a, didn't, yeah. I didn't say won't be viable. I said may oh. not be viable. Yeah, that's true. Sure. May, but, may not. Yeah, anything, and, anything may not be viable. <laughs> right, and anything, and anything may be viable. Yeah. It all depends on if you are willing to pay and what your business model. See, I'm talking about on the business side of things now, yeah. uh, and and a lot of it comes down to are the customers willing to pay what needs to be paid in order to keep the business going that will be creating what you're creating. Uh, so, will it be viable in that way? Probably, but who knows. Uh, we won't know until one company may thrive, another company may crumble. And, and we, we don't know until all of it plays out in terms of what each individual entity is creating, how they're marketing it, where they position themselves with the what customers. their costs are is a big one. And what their costs you know, are. And, and again, I'll bring up like, like Cobalt Press with Tales of the Valiant. I mean, he's got, I think, more than 10 full-time employees or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. It's now... Yeah. It's a decent sized company. I'm pretty sure Kelsey, who who runs Arcane Library and, and mm -hmm. did Shadow Dark RPG, I think it's still just her. Right. <laughs> All right. I don't think she's got any full time employees. Right. What, one of those can sustain a lot more uh, yes. because their costs are so much lower. Exactly. Um, you know, than than another. So yeah. yeah. And 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 yet again, I mean, in that case, and I'm 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 super excited for Tales of the Valiant. I love it. Shadow Dark RPG actually had more people support it. Mm -hmm. So it's it's pretty interesting how that's all playing out. Yeah. It, and I don't it, think we could really guess. 
Right. You know, I, I don't think we'll know what the answer is. Right. If anybody time. out there knows the answer, please let me know right now. <laughs> please email us. <laughs> so, so right. You you could yeah email the the, uh, the the show. Hit us on Twitter. Let yeah. us know what the future holds so we can we can get out in front of it. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, the other question we have this week is from Brian Decker via Mastodon. So this is a toot for you, Mike. Toot. What, what do toot you bag. think are some common rules of good adventure design? I have in mind the design equivalent to don't split the party. And better yet, have you written or seen an adventure that successfully broke or subverted the rules? Uh, this is a, always a hard question for me because for me, it's like, how do you make a good pizza? Uh, can I can I ask one clarifying question? Sure. To, to scope our, are we talking about a published adventure that like one like a writer who's making a published adventure they plan to sell to others? Or are we talking about a GM who is putting together their own adventure for their own group? I would say yes. Both of these? I, I I think both. I think both you have these. to. Okay. You sort of have to answer both, and in some cases it will overlap, and in some cases obviously it will be very different, as you and gotcha. I both know as yeah. people who've <laughs> created done both, yeah, <laughs> right. who've created those. But yeah, you know, a, a good adventure could be a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And so was, as I answer this, I'm going to separate adventure design from encounter design. Obviously, adventures are built from encounters, but we could spend a whole show just talking about encounter design. So I think I'm you gonna, have. Yeah, I'm sure I have more than one. <laughs> uh, so so let's just talk about adventures. First thing is understand the scope and the purpose of what you are trying to accomplish with what you are designing. Are you writing an adventure that is an integral part of a campaign that's in progress? Are you creating this as a one shot that someone is going to play once, get a feel for whatever you're highlighting, and then leave? And if you're highlighting something in this one shot adventure, what is it that you're highlighting? Are you highlighting a certain rule set? Are you highlighting certain character options? Because those things you are definitely going to want to then make an important aspect of that adventure. Uh, with me so far, Mike? I'm with you. With you. So anything to add that to that in terms of scope, in terms of purpose uh, when you design an adventure? I mean, I think so. I'm gonna let you, I'm gonna let you finish. Oh, I'm gonna let you finish. I'm gonna let okay. you finish. Teo Seven D is the greatest podcaster ever, but I'm gonna let you finish. <laughs> but I'm gonna let I'm gonna let you finish. All but, right. Yeah. So, because I, I have a, I have a whole different scope of my view on this. Okay, that's cool. Uh, yeah. So, for for the once you know the purpose, then who are you designing it for? If you are designing it for your home game, you know the party. So you can design it to hit all of the highlights of the characters and the players in your party. Do they love puzzles? They want a puzzle every week. Okay, we're going to give them a puzzle. <laughs> Time to Do find they... a different party. Exactly. Do they love role-playing? <laughs> and they, they only want a couple combats, but they want to spend the time role-playing. Then you're going to design for those. If you don't know the p makeup of the party that will be playing because you're designing it for a publication, you have some tricks you can use. You can design for some of the tropes. So you can design for the sneaky character who wants to stealth around and investigate. You can design for the righteous character who wants to be doing good no matter what. You can design for those sorts of things. One of the greatest things that Wizards did for 5th edition that they, I don't even know if they realized it was great for adventure designers, were the factions. The Zentarum, the, because what that gave you was adventurer types that you could then write adventures for even if you didn't know uh, who the players would be. You've got your dark uh, creepy profit driven Zentarum. You have your uh, holier than thou uh, group. You've got the the leaders, the rulers who just care. <laughs> the rich, the rich suck ups with yes, the Lord's the, Alliance. Lord's Alliance. The, up, the upper 1%. <laughs> right. And, and that was wonderful for an adventure designer to then say, okay, I can put something in for each of these factions. The hippie Harpers. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yep. Uh, so that that's cool. And then what I do when I create adventures is I just think in terms of scenes. I, I And I want a scene to begin and to end, and I want to know what is supposed to happen during that scene. What questions are we trying to answer? What goals are we trying to reach? Uh, if you know those things, then you can put in 
anything that will block that action from happening, to block the players from achieving their goals, block the uh, resolution from happening, whether that's a monster, whether that's skill checks, whether that's role playing, you can put that all in there. Then once you have all your scenes laid out, you have to just remember that you have to give a path from one scene to the next. It doesn't have to be railroad, but it has to be how do the players know to go from the merchant to the noble? Uh, it, it, what clues are they given or are they told just to go there? Make sure that those transitions work uh, and then think in terms of beets. Beets is a word that's overused, not the vegetable, but... Uh, Beats is a term that's overused because it can mean lots of different things, but you can think in terms of beats in the following ways, whether it's emotional notes. So is it hope? Is it fear? Is it, uh, is it rising action? Is it falling action? Those sorts of things. Beats are plot points. So the things that happen that move the story forward. Beats are pillars of play. So you could have an exploration encounter, a uh, combat encounter, role-playing encounter, or a mixture of all of those. And then beats also can be used to show game mechanical things like the beat is going to be rising action and then we have a rest. We can have a short rest here, we can have a long rest there, or the styles of play. Uh, so if you have players that want really brutal, uh, really brutal violent scenes of action, you can do those. Then then break it up just slightly with something with a lighter uh, scene, maybe with some role playing, maybe with some dice rolling, but not combat to to get that style of play active and then move on to a different one. Uh, the last thing is I don't have a big list of do's and don'ts. Uh, because as soon as you say do this or don't do this, then it's good reasons to. There, there'll be a reason not to. So, <laughs> right. right. If you if you go online and just do a random search for you know how how to create a good adventure, you get the same sort of advice. Make a great plot hook. Yes, sure. But if the plot hook is too great, sometimes it can distract from the actual adventure. Uh, I've seen that happen. Uh, a compelling plot is great, and, unless it isn't. Uh, uh, a particular structure I've seen, follow the three act structure, follow the four corner structure. You know, there's all these, uh, all this advice that's great until it's not right. The setting, Oh, it should be wild and fantastical, which can then distract from like the, the hard line story that you're trying to tell. So every, you know, everything could be good. Everything isn't necessarily good though. So I, I don't follow this list of do's and don'ts. Take it away, Mike. Um, so I'm going to split mine into, I think the same way you did, I'll, I'll flip the, the flip the order of like published adventures versus homebrew adventures. I think there's kind of two different, two different things. And I'm going to take, I'm going to kind of pull back a little bit uh, from, you know, open the, the aperture a little bit, but like for published adventures, I think it's just so critical that you really sit down and say, what am I doing for the person who bought this product? What, mm -hmm. how am I making their life easier? GMs are busy, you know, they wanna run a game for their, for their players. What can I do to help them? What material can I give them? What format can I use? What style can I use? If you're not telling a story to them, you're giving them materials. You've said it before, like this is instruction manuals, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is technical writing. Mm -hmm. And our goal is to try to really give material that they can't get on their own that they don't have the time for they don't have the money for you want to give them stuff that really makes their life easy and i and some do it well and some really don't i've done it well and i've also done it very poorly so you know there it, it's it's a hard thing to do uh something that's been a, a, some, a something i paid more attention to is like keep your text short mm -hmm. like just really cut down the amount of your, your word count as much as you can on these things. Uh, I was running two adventures for two different groups. I was running Light of Xeraxis from the, the Spelljammer box set, mm -hmm. and I'm running Scarlet Citadel. And both of them are written by tremendous veterans in this industry who've been doing it forever. One of them is really easy to run, very few words, giving you just what you need in order to set the stage. Still a lot of freedom to let the game go the way you want it to go. But like, I, I hardly had to prep it. The other one has every word in the, you know, every word possible is, is put in the adventure. And it's really hard to parse. Mm -hmm. It's hard to process. I've read it. And then I'm at the game table. And I'm like, what's in this room again? And the room description is three pages long. 
Yeah. And you're like, whole, you know, keep it, keep it really brief. You know, in the words of uh, the, the, the emperor of Austria and Amadeus, like there, there is such a thing as too many notes, yeah. right? Too, too many notes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then, and then one I talk about, which I think is actually useful for both publish and, and, and homebrew adventures. And I've seen some organized play adventures too, that have done this well is try to build a situation. You talked about setting up a series of scenes and there are lots of adventures that way. And, and I, you know, I, I agree that that is definitely a good adventure model. Another adventure model is also building a situation mm -hmm. where you're setting up a location, you're setting up the situation, going at the location, you're filling it with NPCs, you're filling it with monsters. You, you're giving enough information to the GM to tell them how it evolves, depending on what the characters do. And then the characters hit it, however they're going to hit it. Mm -hmm. And I really feel like it, some of the best adventures, like my, my favorite is Ravenloft, right? I love Castle Ravenloft and Castle Ravenloft is really fun and you can run it over and over again because it's a situation mm -hmm. and the players get to decide how they're going to engage with it you have a plot that's going on you have things that they can do but it isn't this you know kind of linear series of scenes it's a whole different avenue and i really enjoy adventures that are written that way too mm -hmm. it's interesting because light as rexus is not written that way like you know i love i loved it but it is also a series of scenes mm -hmm. um then for homebrew adventures i you know i i think that you know figuring out exactly i had to get a prop you know there's a book uh, available that actually helps people with their, uh, um, you know, with, with filling out published event or filling out their homebrew adventures. And, and I, I still agree with it. I still agree with my own work. So, you know, I have eight steps. I follow the eight steps when I'm prepping my adventure. It's a nice framework. It's not the perfect framework for everybody, but it's a nice framework that I use that helps me stay focused on the things that are going to help me run the game. And many other people have come back saying it's helping them too. For, for, and those, stuff, yeah. for those listening, oh, that was podcast. Return, you didn't see the prop. Return of the Lazy return Dungeon of Master. Of the Lazy Dungeon Master. By one. Mike Shea, Mike Shea available at slyflourish.com. Yeah. Yeah. Go to slyflourish.com. There you there. go. So, um, but like, you know, focusing on the characters is a big one. And you talked about it when you're running a homebrew adventure that you have that opportunity. You know who they are. You know what they want. You can ask them. If you don't know, you can ask them, hey, you know, you're while well, sitting around a campfire, what does your character think about the direction they want to take? Right. right. And then write it down and use it. Right. Use it, use it then or use it in a future adventure. But you can get that stuff. Where, where's your adventure going to start? Right. What are you going to do? Right. As your players are sitting down, what's the first thing that's going to happen that's going to grab the attention of the players and drag them into the story and, and let things go? And, and then you kind of don't know what might happen after that. Right. You might have some ideas, but it's, it could be fuzzy because now it's the actions of the characters. So then what are the components that you can prepare ahead of time to help the story go whatever direction the characters are going to take it? And that's something that I focus on a lot in this book. Right. I'm not going to get into all of it. We, you, know, you, you know it. You and I have talked about it a million times. But, you know, and that same thing. And then, of course, building those situations. How do you get all the, com the components together to build that situation and let the players uh, uh, get involved in that situation and navigate it how they want? And what tools are going to use, right? What are, the, what are the specific tools that are going to help you do that improv where it's online? You know, more and more DMs are running games online these days. What are the tools that help you improvise at the table? Uh, a really simple example is like Token Maker, right? There's a, there's a website called Token Maker, and uh, it's so good and so fast. You can build tokens in the middle of a game. So like you don't have to, you know, you can definitely build all the tokens you think you're going to need. But if they're going to fight some weird monsters, like while they're talking about stuff, you could just be in token maker making tokens and then drop them on your map and you're ready to go. Mm -hmm. So what are those tools that, that help you improvise? I think is a big, uh, a big, a big part about, you know, how to, what are the rules and what are the frameworks for, for running homebrew adventures? So those are my thoughts. Yeah. And, and your thoughts and my thoughts are sort of parallel. And I'm going to try to think of the best way to say this. Um, Players see stories, RPG stories, D&D stories, through encounters for the most part, right? It's, okay, do we have time to rest, yes or no? Okay, we go and we do the next thing. Right. Whereas game masters think in terms of story for the most part. Okay, mm -hmm. what what's going to happen next? What do I present next? And it's creating stuff for publication is walking that line between helping the game master by creating encounters for them versus what Mike was talking about, which is giving them the tools to create their own encounters. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and sometimes the audiences are very different for what they want. Right. Yep. There are times when I sit down to run an adventure and I don't want to have to build the encounter. 
<laughs> right. <laughs> especially if it's going to be integral to the story, especially if I want there to be some elegance to the play. If I want some sprinkled clues in Encounter 1 to play out in Encounter 3, 4, and 5, I'm not going to remember that as somebody who's creating it on my own. So I need that sort of help from the creator of the adventure to do that for me, to to yeah. to, to lay lay out those tracks that I can follow. Yeah, I don't um, I don't yeah, I agree. Like I don't think for a published adventure that you can get away with having like all of the little dishes of components mm -hmm. and then expect that the DM who's going to run it is going to use them. I actually tried that with Ruins of the Grendel Root. Uh, you know, I have a book of adventures called Runes of the Grand Road, 10 Adventures, level one to five. And in them, I, I first started off by saying it's going to be a toolkit, adventure toolkits, that they are going to be like locations and monsters mm -hmm. and NPCs and situations, and they're all separate. And you sort of piece them together. And I had, <laughs> I had early feedback from people that were like, why don't you just tell me what to do? Like, you clearly know what the answer is. Why are you making me go through all this work? And I was like, whoa, work. That is not what I want you to be doing is work. Right. Right. So I changed them. And now they are sort of like specific scenes. Now, those scenes can happen in lots of different ways and right. in lots of different order, but mm -hmm. they still exist. If you go to this location and you go to this area, this is what might be going on here. And this is what might be going on here if circumstances had changed because of this other thing. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's and that's kind of laid out. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's you can still have encounters even if you are creating a dungeon like or castle yeah. ravenloft you can go through it in any order but even but the 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 locations that you're setting up are ripe for a certain kind of encounter generally yeah or or a couple different variations but you want the you want the dms to be able to look at it and understand okay this is how I'm going to run it because this makes sense in terms of everything that's come before. And the players will both expect it, but also be surprised by it. That's sort of the dual thing that you try to do when you're writing fiction is make it make logical sense while still surprising and delighting the reader. Um, and that sort of thing needs to play through uh, when you design an adventure or it, it hopefully does when you design an adventure. Uh, any anything I, I else? Agree. Yeah, toot toot bag. Yeah, and any other thing to add for no. uh, for Mike? Nope. No, that sounds good. Okay, well, uh, thank you to Brian and to Falcon Neil for those questions. Now we will move on to news because we have news this week. We're not going to dig too deep into some of the news because <laughs> we're going to hold ourselves a, back. Yeah. Because the first big thing that happened was the what I'm going to start calling the 5e 2e uh, D and D playtest packet number six. I'm going, I'm going with the 2024 D and D refresh. See, 5e 2e, 5e 2e, 5e 2e is nice. There's way four, fewer syllables. Four yeah, syllables. 20, 2024 D and D refresh is a little mouthy. Yeah, right? it's yeah. a little, little takes a little time for sure. Uh, the the playtest packet dropped. It was 77 pages. <laughs> Uh, it was big. Lots of videos, including like a one hour introduction yep. to yep. it. Uh, uh, there's a link in the show notes. We also have Cobalt Press with two play tests uh, dropping, including an overlap on the Druid. Yeah, yeah, there was two. Yeah. They did they did an open play test for small folk, mm -hmm. and they did including Cobalt. They have Cobalt's and small folk, uh, and a separate one. That was pretty short, four pages, I think. Mm -hmm. And then they had a good sized. Uh, play test that covered a bunch of class stuff, including, and the one thing that caught my eye was like both groups were taking a hard look at Druids. So I was like, oh, this is interesting. Like we're seeing both of them in the same week. And that nice. was pretty fascinating, like how they're handling things like what what uh, what Wizards calls Moon Druids and what Cobalt Press calls uh, Shifter Druids, mm -hmm. uh, which are very similar kind of functions. So that was pretty interesting. Cool. Uh, but what we're not going to do is get into the details of that because it's a lot of content. <laughs> it's about hundred and some pages. Yeah, it happened. All, all totally. It all happened. It, it all it, came down. It happened. There it is. And it's totally fine if you have opinions and thoughts, and you can share your opinions and thoughts. Maybe at some point we will cover this, but for the most part, my I, my opinion is I can read all of this, and in the end, Wizards is going to publish what Wizards is going to publish, and that's what I'm worried about. Uh, what they actually yeah. published that I will have to deal with. I don't so. have to worry about it. They're doing what they're going to do. Exactly. exactly. My my worry is not going to affect that. Yep. <laughs> not going to affect that outcome. 
Yep. Uh, I did. I did like that they nerfed Stunning Strike. And if there's anybody out there who's really angry that they nerfed it, I suggest you email Teos. Okay. Teos yep. wants. Teos would definitely like to hear about your uh, issues with Stunning Strike. For sure. You can find Teos on Mastodon at Alpha yep. Stream. You can get. Yeah. On and there if right he now. doesn't respond, send him on multiple platforms. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. We'll put his. Uh, well, you can text him. You can yep. text him while he's in the Mediterranean. Uh, sure. He said that would be fine. We'll put his right. full uh, phone number his, in his the full, show notes. Full, for phone mail, for, uh, phone mail, yeah. uh, email, phone mail, <laughs> phone mail, and uh, mailing address. And if that wasn't enough, the Open RPG Creator License, what you might know as Orc, has dropped. Uh, so I just want to make games. I I don't want to think about legal things. I want to <laughs> have elves and dwarves doing doing th stuff. So Mike, could you could you tell me? What do I need to know as a creator about this orc license, what it means, what it means in terms of the old gaming license and the, the Creative Commons version and, and all of that? So I, I mentioned talking to you before that I did a 20 minute segment on my show this week about it and then deleted it from the video because I'm like, it's too boring and nobody <laughs> wants to hear this. <laughs> Cut it. So Nothing's I'm gonna try too to boring for us, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to try to be really brief. Well, the good thing is I've now done a whole rehearsal. That's good. Of, of this. So I'm going to try to keep it as brief as possible because I've been thinking about it a lot. I've actually been talking to some other publishers about it uh, now that it's out. Like, what, is it, what does it mean and what are some of the things going on? Uh, my, my opinion is that it is definitely a better OGL, okay. right? That the, the Orc license itself is doing a lot of what the OGL did. But it's better in a few ways. Better and, and it's better in at least two ways, mm -hmm. and maybe better depending on your point of view. In a third, uh, a it is actually an irrevocable perpetual license. It doesn't have any mealy mouth, little wormy things like authorized versions, which is what caused the whole GL mm -hmm. fiasco. It does not have that. It is not held by any one company. Definitely, Paizo was heavy behind it. Uh, Azora Law was the law firm that actually wrote it and drafted it, but it was drafted in the open. Many variants, many versions were put in the draft. I don't know that it certainly didn't make everybody happy, but you, you know, it was drafted out there in the open for months. Mm -hmm. And third, it's not, and it, it was so, and as part of that, it is actually going to be held at the Library of Congress. It's, mm -hmm. you know, the the full reference isn't going to be held in online at any one company's URL. It's they're actually submitting it to the Library of Congress so that there is a version out there, and it is just the one license. They say they are never making another one. They're not going to update it. You can't update it. It's just there. Now, the one kind of controversial piece to it is that um, it it specifically says that if you're using the license, you are automatically uh, licensing any of your game mechanics uh, in what you're using. So before with OGL, there was sort of this way of saying like, well, here's what pro here's product identity, which is stuff that is I'm keeping for myself that you can't use. And then here's open gaming content, which is stuff you can. And there was no differentiation about whether it was game mechanic stuff or like story focused stuff. Mm -hmm. This one is specifically saying any game mechanic stuff that you put in there is by default uh, licensable content. Their, their version of, of uh, open gaming content is licensable content. Mm -hmm. And that means like if you write a stat block to a monster and say, I don't want that monster stat block to be usable uh, downstream, with Orc, you cannot make that limitation. Like that stat block is available. You can still limit things like trademark names of monsters. So they can't use that particular name with that stat block, but the mechanics of the stat block, the mechanics of your game system, the mechanics of your spells, the mechanics of magic items, anything like that are automatically in, uh, uh, you know, automatically released, which again is a benefit for some people because there's good arguments to be made that you can't really copyright game mechanic stuff anyway. Mm -hmm. There's people that say that's absolutely true. There's people that say it's absolutely not. If you're using this license, you are saying that that is true, at least for this product. You're saying I'm I am releasing this and I'm allowing downstream publishers to be able to use that stuff. Mm -hmm. Now it is also a, what they refer to as like a viral license. Which means if I have if I write a product and I use Orc in mine and you say I like Mike Shea's thing that he used, I want to use that in mine, you also have to use Orc on your product. And thus you are also releasing all of your game mechanics under the same license. And anybody downstream from you that's using your stuff also has to follow it. So it means that once you start using that license, that license, anybody downstream from you has to continue to use that license for everything that's going on forward. Okay. Um, the alternative is like the Creative Commons Attribution License, mm -hmm. which is what 
uh, Wizards of the Coast released the uh, uh, the 5.1 SRD, and at the end of the OGL fiasco, was their their final big like, oh, we're really sorry. Here it is, right. and that one is not a viral license. That if I, I I have to follow the limitations of that license by attributing the uh you know, attributing where i got it but i can keep all of the rest of my work copywritten i can actually use other licenses i can make my own stuff creative commons by license so that one is not a viral license you do not you know the cc by share alike license is a viral license mm -hmm. cc by sa it's called that one is also a viral license but the cc by license that wizards use and lots of people are using i'm using it for i have like a lazy gm resource document that i put out under cc by mm -hmm. and that's saying i don't care what you're doing with it downstream you can use it however you want as long as you're referencing my work as long as you have a little blurb somewhere in your thing that says you use mike jay's thing mm -hmm. you can use whatever you license you want so i i tend to prefer that license because i don't want to dictate what people downstream from me have to submit to in order to use my material i i like cc by you know, when I'm, when I want, if I'm going to bother to license anything, I'm going to set up a separate document. I'm going to put everything in it that I want people to be able to use. And I put it out CC by so that they can decide, do I want to keep everything copywritten and not release anything? Do I want to use CC by you can even have orc happen downstream. They could decide to use orc and that's okay because orc is compatible with CC by, but not the other way. Mm. And that's one of the things that's interesting. So as a creator, you have to decide how important it is to you that people downstream from you have to release all of their game mechanics. Mm -hmm. If that is important to you and you want that to happen and you want to make sure that they're using the same license that you use, then Orc seems like a good license for it. If, however, you want downstream publishers to have the freedom to be able to use that material however they want, I think a CC BY license is a better way to go. And that's the one that I recommend. Okay. So what SRD is associated with Orc? There, uh, so the, there is no single SRD associated with Orc. Okay. Orc can be used on any SRD. And again, gotcha. an example is Level Up Advanced 5e, Morris over at NWorld Publishing, who yep. runs Level Up Advanced 5e, immediately released all of A5e under Orc. Okay. All he said was, everything in A5e is also available under Orc. And, and he did it like, you know, put it up on a web page and it was done. Okay. Now, that same SRD is also available under Creative Commons BY. You know, it's also under CC BY, which means there's another license that he already has been using for it that is less restrictive. So I don't know why I would bother to use the Orc license for that. Right. But he, his, his answer to that was, well, now you have a choice. If you want to use ORC, you can use ORC. If you want OGL, because a lot of people are still using OGL. It's not broken. It was right. never deauthorized. Right. I seriously doubt Wizards is going to try to deauthorize it again. That didn't, didn't seem to go so well didn't, the first yeah, time. Yeah. So, but, you know, and, and so he said it's released under all three licenses. You pick whatever license you want. So if for some reason somebody is loyal to ORC and wants to use ORC, they can. But I could still use ORC and still use his Creative Commons version. So it was an interesting thing. But yeah, the answer is any SRD can use it. Any, mm, any okay. product can use it. It doesn't even have to be an SRD. You can gotcha. like that's actually one advantage of ORC is like the OGL, I can publish an entire book. And then in the front of that book, I can say, I am licensing material on the, uh, in this book under ORC. This is my product identity that you cannot use. And this is the stuff that is specifically saying you can use as licensed content. And it automatically includes any mechanics I put in that book. Mm -hmm. And that way you don't have to have an SRD because most of them don't like most uses of the OGL don't have an SRD. Right. Okay. Awesome. I still don't know anything, but I appreciate. <laughs> I, I tried. Uh, I tried, man. No, no, you, 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 you did. You, you did your best. You did your best. Uh, it's going to be hard to penetrate this thick skull. If you want to give something, I'll give, I'll give you a short answer. If you, Mike Shea's opinion, right? Uh, okay. People argue. The short answer is if you want people to be able to use your work in other commercial works, consider using the CC by mm -hmm. this, the Creative Commons Attribution License. It's a really good license. It's been around for 20 years. Bil literally billions of products use it. Mm -hmm. Cool. There you go. You heard it here first from Mike Shea or second or third, depending on yeah, um, might, might where, heard somewhere else, right? where else you've heard. Uh, Mike, yeah. you can decide if you want to cut this part from the show like I do. Uh, <laughs> definitely, do. I don't have the technology to do this. <laughs> like I can't be bothered. <laughs> exactly. Uh, but we got news that Beetle and Grimm is going big by going smaller. What you might ask? Well, they are including now in their latest product less than they normally do. So this is a an enigmatic in-world golden vault assignment folder for keys from the golden vault. It is only $95. What doesn't it include? Well, it doesn't include the adventure that it's for as it has in the past. So we've seen some of their big boxes, 
some of their platinum editions, $300, $400, $500, $500 containing the adventure and all the props and maps and stuff. So what they're doing here is for $95, you get this assignment folder with 13 player maps, 13 DM maps, six battle maps scaled uh, to, you know, for grid play, 13 in-world call to action letters, and nine additional in-world handouts. And I thought, yeah, this is interesting. It's interesting that they're taking this tact. This is probably the one of the smallest things that Beetle and Grimm has done uh, to support one of these big Watsi products. And I'm wondering if it's just profit profit margins are getting slimmer and slimmer. So they're they're trying this. Um, any any thoughts? Did you have yeah. you ever bought any Beetle and I, Grimm uh, stuff? Yes, I bought one, and one I was I was given as a for for uh, they they gave me one to this back when Justice Armand was working for uh, Beetle and Grimm, and 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 Justice is very kind and sent me uh, I think uh, managed to get the powers that be to send me their platinum edition of uh, Curse of Strahd, which uh, as I mentioned before is my favorite adventure of all time. So it was really cool to have that that box set. Um, what's interesting about this one is half the price of their cheapest set. Mm -hmm. So they often do these silver editions, which are pretty, I mean, depending on affordable, I would argue if you're going to run, you know, 70, 80, 90 hours of a campaign, $200 isn't totally out of hand, right? right. Dollar per hour is pretty good. And um, uh, so they, they had these $200 sets. They have them for like Spelljammer. They have them for Dragon Heist. Uh, I had the uh, silver edition of, um, uh, what's it? The Seafaring one. Uh, Ghost of Saltmarsh. Ghost of Saltmarsh. And yeah, and and it's really really quality stuff. Uh, so and it's yeah. So I think I think doing a lower price one makes sense. Like why not test? You they've they've certainly tested the high end with five hundred dollar box mm -hmm. sets. They're probably not going to go much higher than that. Maybe they could. Here's a thousand dollar really good set. I don't know yeah. what it comes with. Um, it comes with the designer. It comes in a box. Um, and so the idea of like, well, let's try one where we, we strip it down even, even thinner, uh, could be good. A lot of the material is fantastic. Like I really, really like it. My only, my only trick in using these is my adventures tend to go off the rails pretty quickly. And a lot of the material that comes in the boxes are expecting you to be running the adventure as is, mm -hmm. which I don't really do. Some of it is still useful, but I remember in the ghost of salt marsh, I had a letter that uh, was like the deed to the mansion and written on the bottom of the letter was one of the main bad guys that the characters already knew was a bad guy. And I'm like, I don't think that he's going to be signing the lease to your establishment yeah. after you've already like been trying to hunt him down to the far corners of the earth. So there were little like weird bits where like, I can't really use, you know, I can't really use every piece. And there are good, you know, good chunks of it where it's like, because of the way the adventure went, I, I ended up not using the material that they had. So that, that felt like I'd left money on the table. Yeah. But it's the quality is fantastic. And it's like, it's either this you got to print all this stuff out yourself or right you know. so yeah it's neat 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 stuff so i'm i'm yeah i'm yeah. excited I'm ex and in this case it looks like it lines up with sort of the smaller adventures so it's not necessarily one ongoing campaign i haven't read keys from the golden vault yet so uh i assume that that's sort of the oh here's the th here's the letter calling you to action here's your map here's my map and we just go through these 13 different uh mini adventures if you will so it'll, it'll be interesting. If anybody out there has purchased it or knows any more about it, let us know what you think of it, uh, especially in comparison to some of the other stuff that they've done. Yeah, and they're clearly not shying away from the great big sets either. They have the legendary mm -hmm. edition of the Fandelver and Below adventure mm -hmm. that's coming out. True. And that's a three, big $350 yeah. you know, plat, you know, premium box set. So, yeah. that, that's one. That's the one adventure I'm, I'm looking forward to. Uh, but that's just me. I love I love going back to the same place over and over and over again. Can I can it. I just complain? Like yeah. I wanted this adventure ten years ago. Yeah. Right. Like, do you know how many times I've had people say like, "Hey, what am I supposed to play after Lost Mine of Found Delver? And I'm like, "I don't know. Like, nothing really fits very well." And now ten years later, two starter sets later, like, "Oh, we're going back to Found Delver." Like, Why? Hey, what I've been to, I've been back to Found Delver for an Adventures League adventure and Acquisitions Incorporated. We went back Excellent. there. Yeah. So. Yeah, yeah. Uh, th there's the answer now, Mike. There's, there's the, answer the answer to your question. Perfect. What do you do? I should have been given that all along. Speaking of going back to a place over and over and over again, Baldur's <laughs> Gate 3 uh, is now updated for a release on August 3rd on PC and September 6th on PlayStation. I have not checked it out yet, although people in my home group have been playing and really, really loving it. Um, at Larian Studios, uh, 
yeah, has made fantastic. some has made some great yeah. games, and yeah. you know, having played Destiny, uh, I I want to see uh, what they, what they're doing here. Destiny or Divinity? Divinity, Divinity the original sorry. sin. Yeah, yeah. D- D- Divinity. Sorry. Yeah, Divinity. Yeah. So, uh, have you yeah. have you had a chance to look at the game? Yeah. So, I, yeah, I'm a big fan. I played Divinity: Original Sin two all the way through. I pre-ordered. I was on the alpha, or whatever they call it. The what do they what do they call it when you give them money early by the thing? Sucker. And, yeah, sucker. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because I bought it when I had a PC, and now I don't even have a PC to play it on anymore. Oh, it's been so long. Like it feels like it's been four years. I don't know, mm-hmm. right? It came out around the it's same insane. time Descent to Avernus came out, so yeah. <laughs> it's been a long time. And now I hear it's going to be on PlayStation Five, and I'm like, I totally want to play it on that. But I already paid all this money back then to get the PC version. I'll probably just buy it again. I think yeah. I just, like you said, sucker. Yeah. So, um, but it, yeah, it looks it looks really good, and and I hope to be you know bored of Diablo Four enough to uh, mm-hmm. to play this one. It comes out in September. Cool. So keep that uh, keep that in mind going forward. Last but not least in our news, let's talk about a couple of crowdfunding things. First of all, if you're a Savage Worlds fan, there will be a Kickstarter soon for its 20th uh, anniversary with its fifth printing, bundles, and more. New player guides with various covers, accessories, including edge cards and tokens. Uh, it's... It was over about a, about a hundred thousand dollars after its first week, and this ends July twenty seventh. There is a link in the show notes. You play Savage Worlds at all? No, I I bought a lot of Savage World stuff and have looked into it. I think I might have played once in a one shot, but it's mm-hmm. definitely one of the list of, of games I'd love to I'd, I'd love to try out. Yeah, I hear a, lots of great things about. Yeah, it. Yeah, same here. There's a big community near here that plays all the different flavors of it, and. And uh, I've played it a few times. It's a good game, good solid game. So if yeah. you are a fan, you can check out the Kickstarter until it ends on July 27th. Uh, if you are a Ghostfire gaming fan, the Ethereal Expanse setting Who isn't? Guide. Who's exactly. not a Ghostfire gaming fan? Get out of here if you're not. Fan. Uh, so in case you've missed the, the whole story behind it, when we were doing Fables at Ghostfire, we had uh, the second and the third season of Fables were Pirates of the Ethereal Expanse and Agents of the Empire both set in this uh, setting. So now we are putting out the full setting guide to support those two adventures, plus whatever other uh, content you want to create in, in that. There's about a week left as of when this show airs, and we're creeping up on $200,000, so we su- appreciate all the support so far, and you can go check it out if you haven't seen it yet. Yep, I backed it. I can't wait. I'm really excited for it. Cool, cool. But I want to hear more about Forge of Foes. I heard it was released, and I downloaded PDFs this morning. Nice. I want to know why this is the last thing, like why we're talking about it now. It's the last thing in news. Like this, you know, headliner. This is the headliner. This is the headliner. All right. But I guess I'll, I'll take what I can. I'm saving the best for last, Mike. Taking the best for last. Yes, Forge of Foes was released. to Teos and Scott and I. I've been working our asses off on this thing. And uh, yeah, it, and the, the PDF was released to our 7,100 backers. And um, the feedback has been fantastic. Like this has been very, very exciting. We're still, you know, in that, in the early stages of getting it ready to go to print. Uh, but we're super excited that people have it in hands. People are, you know, building monsters with it. People are reading it and really enjoying it. So we couldn't be happier. It really, it really is great. I'm very happy with it. Well, congratulations to you three you. on on that. And I can't wait to open my PDF. I had to record some stinking podcast oh. first, but oh. I'll get to it right after. <laughs> You'll enjoy it. 